All right. Welcome everyone um, to our final breakout session for today. We are with Chris Beach of Unicon. And uh, <clears throat> Chris is currently involved in the support and development of open source software, including Open Aquila, UPortal, and Fizon. Chris sits on the Open Aquila Advisory Board, the Open Aquila Security Group, and is a UPortal committer. Previously, Chris was a senior support analyst for Aquila at Pearson, where he was involved with the hosting support and escalated client support of Aquila. Welcome, everyone. Um, if you have questions, I know Chris is pretty good about watching the chat. You can put them in there. Um, and we can also, if need be, uh, address any questions at the end. All right. Thank you, Jen. Go ahead and share my screen here. I appreciate folks putting um, putting where they're from and uh, the the technologies they work with in the chat. Uh, we're really there's not a lot of content that I plan to present. This is really supposed to be a discussion with um, with you folks, and it's really nice to have you know a, a larger group on uh, that we can talk about what your biggest tech challenges are or the ways that you have solved some of your biggest challenges in technology with education. Uh, so some of the goals, uh, and it's going to be kind of free form. Uh, ultimately, what we want to talk about is we want to knowledge share for possible solutions, right? To look at the strategies that we all have coming in and then say, this person is able to solve a similar strategy over here. I want to go talk to them. Okay. Um, so we're going to explore some educational tech challenges. What are your strategies? What drove you to adopt your current solution? Uh, take a look at understanding your vision, um, kind of going forward, how do you want to support your educational um, mandates and goals through technology? Uh, I'd be really interested to know that technological hole that you see in your university that you want filled, right? Is there a reason that you came to open a pair in terms of I'm looking for a piece of technology um, or maybe not, maybe you're just looking at what other people have done and that's okay too and then like I said ultimately we want a knowledge share um, so this will not be a very effective presentation if I'm the only one talking uh, this is kind of a, a prototype um, to see if we can have this be a, a recurring open aperio discussion right so if you um, if you can see something that maybe might be more effective uh, please just shout it out or send me an email and and I'd be happy to to kind of mold this to be what would be most useful to folks um, and then I will work with the moderators to see what we are able to post for the communities uh, the folks widest range of use out of this as possible in terms of possible topics that I've come up with, really, you know, anything in educational tech, right? So I listed the the um, some possible topics out there: dashboards, student information systems, authentication, content management, um, you know, and then you know the list goes on. Um, and so what I'd like to do is open it up to the group on on just if something in in those topics is something you about let's go ahead and start a discussion um, but if if we hear crickets that's okay um, content management is more my wheelhouse and we can start doing some more focused questions but I'll leave it open to the group right now for you know what do you want to talk about right now um, hi this is Tiffany from uh, UVA I think our biggest challenge is not so much the technology itself but one of the greater technology gaps is getting the users to use the right tools and how to use them well. Uh, Cause that's something we hear a lot from students is that their instructors aren't using Sakai or you know, whatever other tools are available that have integrations or that are in use at UVA. They're not using them or not using them in the right way um, to be effective. Interesting, thank you. Anyone else will see tech changes for you? Sorry, Chris, uh, you're cutting out there. Is this any better? Yeah. All right. Uh, so what, what other tech challenges do you folks have? Well, I could respond to that tech challenge a little bit. Well, 
or do you want to get uh, some other items on the board before we just start discussing them? No, I think you can go ahead, Matt. So we have the same problem here at BYU Idaho. And what I've found is that, you know, if someone needs help uh, with a product or they, they don't use a product, it's typically, typically because they don't feel comfortable with it or they don't see the value. And so traditional, you know, training and educational methods don't seem to work that well where they say, well, you can call into this number and they'll help you. When we implemented Equella, I mean, we've been on the product for seven years now. I would say it took several years just to really get things going. And the way that I think that 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 I that we solved, we haven't completely solved the problem, but you have to have a group of people who are willing to sit down with faculty and work with them one on one in their office because they have lots of things going on. They're just trying to keep their class going. They have to grade papers. They really don't like fiddling around. I mean, there are exceptions, but there are a lot of faculty that don't really like fiddling around with the technology. So if you can go to their office, try to understand what they would like to accomplish, and then work through the tool with them. And, and so, one of the problems we had initially with it with Equella was that uh, the performance with Pearson hosting was, you know, it wasn't as good as we would have hoped. But uh, when we had uh, Unicon host the product, we haven't had any performance problems at all. So that allowed us to get some some different groups on campus, particularly our online group. They, we have a very large online component at our university. They started to adopt. So you don't wanna take a product or a, uh, technology to a faculty member if it's not really solid because the first time it doesn't work right, then you're done. They're not gonna, it's very difficult to get them to come back. Once you've established that the technology is solid that they also want to know that the campus isn't get, gonna get rid of it in a couple of years. So that's another reason that we've had faculty not want to adapt, adopt technology is like, well, what, are you gonna get rid of this in two years? Um, so once you've convinced them that the product will be around or the service and that it is reliable, then you can sit down and start working through the technical issues with them and you know, we have a faculty technology center that's pretty good that they can call into on a number of things, but they're not going to call into the faculty technology center to get to start on a new product. Um, so I, I make myself available. I go all over campus. I sit in faculty offices. I help them with Equella. And I found what what ends up happening is when I help them with Equella, they say, well, can you help me with this? You know, can you help me with the, we're not, we're not a Sakai site, we have Canvas, but say, can you help me with this? Can you help me do a podcast? Can you help me do a screencast? And so I found just anecdotally from my own experience is that if you are willing to, to go to a faculty member's office, spend the time that they need, respond to their concerns, they'll, they'll adopt. But if you, if you say, here's this technology and here's a, here's a sheet that explains how to use it or call into this number, they're not gonna do it. And that's all I've got to say about that. I hear a lot of one-on-one -on -one FaceTime helping faculty get, uh, get interested in the technology that you make available. Yeah, and then if you can get uh, Brian, other faculty, sorry. Yeah, go ahead, no, go ahead. If you can get other faculty who are kind of progressive, who like the technology to, to help, that, that is really a successful thing because they're, if they know that their peers are using it and their peers are supporting it and their peers are willing to help them, 
that's when you really start to have adoption in a department. And I see what Tiffany is saying here in the chat is, uh, uh, you know, really true. It's an ongoing issue that you just have to keep working at. Yeah, and that's interesting, right? It's not necessarily about the tech, it's about driving adoption. Yeah. Uh, Brian, you made a comment uh, that your concern is that all this mess will drive mindset towards what you see in your university. Um, yeah, I mean, and by all this mess, I mean, all this, you know, COVID reshuffling of life to an online space. I mean, I've already seen us push away from uh, technologies like uh, we have web access, which is built on cosine standard. Um, and now as a result of everything, we're starting to have conversations about dumping that entirely and moving to Microsoft. Uh, I forget what their SSO backend is, but um, I mean, my concern is that things that are risky and risk will be perceived as, hey, we, we tried to do this cool thing in this one Sakai tool and it didn't scale this one time because of a server, that those will instantly just be viewed as, you know, okay, well, we need to go back to what's stable, air quotes, stable. I know it's stable, but, <laughs> um, and not take risk and let's just use Microsoft or Google products and call it a day. It is interesting. I mean, there was the uh, that lightning talk with uh, it was Josh who gave that um, that poll out right about new features versus you know keeping the what other people are used to right um, and not upgrading your your application. Does anyone have some sort of like a more of like a continuous integration model where they're able to add new features and fix bug fixes quickly um, versus uh, you know. We, we upgrade once a year, essentially, because and we do it during a break, so there's no disruption. I will say as part of everything that happened, we were able to radically shift policy from a uh, generally three times a year upgrade schedule to a every Monday morning, I'm allowed to upgrade production now. Oh, wow. Um, mostly as a result of the initial influx of students and me being able to finally say, not just say in a quiet voice, hey, we should look at this, you know, cloud delivery of certain uh, systems and instead switching to like, we have to deliver via cloud systems for some of this stuff or we will not exist. <laughs> so we were able to, yeah. you know, always leverage a crisis to your advantage when you can. Interesting. So in terms of, I mean, that's, that's pretty frequent every Monday. That's, that's actually really interesting to hear. So what, what tools do you then upgrade or have the ability to upgrade then every Monday? Um, so if, we, and, and it's more that there's an upgrade window. So if we choose to upgrade mm -hmm. then, um, so I, I'm the, the lead developer on Elms Learning Network and our, our hacks, hacks the web properties. So it's mostly content management driven, um, but we do have quite a bit of student to student, um, peer to peer work going on in a studio tool that we have. So, I mean, it, the things that I'm allowed to now upgrade impact you know, 4,000 or so students directly, and then probably another 6,000 on top of that. I mean, Penn State's like 100,000, you know, university, so 10% is nothing, but um, it has been good in getting us onto a much more agile mindset internally, as far as, hey, we've got these changes. Well, you know, Brian already put in place a workflow where we could push out rapid change. We just haven't historically because of concerns from faculty. So uh, oddly, those concerns seem to have gone away and it's more of now that they realize we can fix problems more agilely, they're a little more accepting of, you know, rough around the edges stuff at times. I, Interesting. Thank you. I think it's not only, you know, you when you upgrade it or when you adding a new features, but how you promote the new features or bug fixes to the users. Because even though we upgrade every annually or you know, bi-annually, bi but 
uh, once we upgraded, we added all new features, information on the web page, and advertised that. And um, the if faculty didn't buy that, it didn't use it. It it's not it's useless basically. So what I think it, we we do also consider about the like a Microsoft Tuesday, you know, um, patchy day, something like that. But um, we end up not doing that. But um, you know, advertising or promoting new feature of bug fix is more uh, is more important than the bug fix or advertising itself. So what we do is, um, if faculty uh, interesting about new feature or uh, uh, faculty complain about the bug, and then once we fix it, we contact that specific faculty and tell them, you know, new version is all fixed that one, new version meet your needs. So let that that faculty, you know, spread that words to another faculty or another users. But and you know, we keep trying actually. Interesting. Thank you, Sang Hoon. So for the for like the U Portal dashboard people um, out there, have you found any um, have you been able to leverage in terms of training um, and you know here's some new bug fixes that are now available? Um, has that been able to be pushed out through the dashboard or is that not really since yet in your institution? Yeah, we, we have our new Sakai new page. And so whenever we upgraded or whenever we got a bug fix, we advertise that and we also advertise MOTD. We email them and we have a, a Sakai committee, Sakai administration team committee. So we, uh, you know, we serve them and we tried. Okay. But still, you know, when we do the survey and faculty complain about, oh, Saka has this bug. Uh, although we already fixed that, <laughs> we already emailed them. <laughs> yeah. Good. What else are people thinking about in terms of their tech challenges? All right, let's let's uh, have one of these uh, these questions for talk about content management. I was talking with um, Jolie at Duke, um, I think it was two days ago, about leveraging OER. Uh, so there's lots of content that people create, teachers create for their institutions, um, and then content that they expose. Uh, but how do we how do we make how do we share that content in a way that's and then talking about like that resilience network um, that's it's more collaborative and we don't feel like we're competing, right? If um, you know if do puts out some open resources that people at you know a you know a quote competing institution at that level uh, would feel comfortable using. How do you how do you handle that? Maybe I can ask it a different way, uh, and maybe just kind of a simpler question: Who uses open educational resources? Um, we use them uh, at BYU Idaho. Uh, I work in the library, and I will have 
faculty typically that are working on a course, um, we have a lot of our regular faculty that are course leads for online courses. And there's a number of our courses, especially in the health science department where the courses, the content is the same, whether it's being taught online or face-to-face. -face. And in some of these, we have a lot more online sections than in-class sections. And so, uh, and one of the imperatives of the university is to lower the cost of education. So they, they really like to not use textbooks if they can. So they'll ask me to go out and find resources. And so I'll look, I'll look for different places uh, to find textbooks if I can, or I'll pull chapters from, from open education resources, and then we, we put them in Equella. So I can take an Equella contribution, and I can make that, a contribution's like a container, for those that aren't familiar with it, uh, with Equella, but I can put multiple items in there. So I can put a link to a chapter in a book. I'm, <clears throat> I might pull that chapter and load it into Equella. I might point to it, depending on what the rights management are. Uh, I'll find, you know, articles from resources that we subscribe to. Um, or other free resources, a lot of them from USA.gov, especially in health science. There's lots of free, uh, good resources there. Sometimes, the f sometimes for a particular course, if it's used for our pathway program, where students are paying much lower fees, let's, let's say it's a it's a it's a course where they don't have subscription rights to a lot of our you know databases and other things that we pay for. I have to find all free resources. So for example, in our pathway program that I talked about in our, my presentation this morning, we have, you know, we have students all over the world and the cost per credit is based on the country. So for example, if they're do, taking a course in Bosnia, the cost is $20 per credit. Or in uh, certain African countries, it's $9 credit. So I have to find all free resources. So that usually ends up being a combination of, of locally created content by faculty, OER content, and other free content like things that are available on USA.gov. So we have a lot of courses that are, don't have any licensed content at all. Because when you're offering a course for $9 a credit, you can't really afford to be paying for content. In the US, I think it's $75 a credit. So very, very, very inexpensive. Interesting use case for it. Any other experiences people have had with OER, um, you know, either needing to use it or creating it and, you know, maybe some of the challenges or successes in um, sharing that with the community? All right, let's take a look at another, um, I'm just looking at the chat here. Some folks are saying that they, they have looked at OER but have not really, really used it or creating it yet. Um, Elni, can you talk a little bit more about why that is? Is that just due to um, not knowing where to get it or is it not curated well enough? Or, you know, what are, what are, your, um, what are the struggles you've, you've identified in um, and why you aren't using OER? Um, uh, well, my colleagues that are in the session can correct me if I'm wrong. Uh, this is my personal take on it. But I think one of the biggest problems that we have is we we do have um, faculty members that are involved with OERs and um, that, that are interested, but our university policy kind of restricts us. 
So it's very difficult for us to determine what we are allowed to share and what not. Um, most of the content that we create or that faculty create belongs to the university and is copyrighted by the university. Um, so that has been one of the biggest challenges just to figure out what are we allowed to share and what not. Um, yeah. That is interesting. Do you have some sort of a, a centralized way for your university um, to uh, uh, to kind of curate content that might be made available to um, to the outside world? Uh, it's been on our to do list or our wish list for some time, but no, we actually don't have a a platform or anything in place at the moment. I know that some of my colleagues have been looking at Equella. Mm -hmm. um, so I'm hoping that will happen soon. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. But um, yeah, we don't really have a, a place for anything at the moment. Okay. It's just what yeah. we have on Sakai. <laughs> okay. So can maybe some of the Sakai, how, do you, how can we enable VR through Sakai, right? I mean, Open Equella can do that. And you know that's one of its things. What so does that? Um, I would say it does well. Um, but maybe you don't have the resources to spin up Open Aquella or whatnot. Um, is there a way to make uh, resources available to the outside world inside of Sakai? I don't know. Um, I know that it's possible to share things publicly when you host in Sakai. Yeah, so Tiffany's in the resources tool, if you make things public, yes. Okay. So that is possible. It's, um, a possible way to share, but yeah, it, it keeps coming back to the whole copyright and um, also I know they are worries about the firewall. Interesting. Uh, Brian, how do you, um, how do you handle OER with Hack CMS? Is that a, is that a thing inside of, of Hack CMS or is it more for internal um, institution usage? Did we lose Brian? We lost Brian. I'll have to ask him later. Um, okay, good. If you, um, only if you want to reach out to folks, um, the adopters of like Open Aquila, this isn't really supposed to be like a plug for a specific application, but there are people out there that like, I know Matt Miles, um, I'd be happy to talk about it. You know, what, what uses um, could you guys have for that kind of thing, right? Because as I've been looking at OER, you know, I want to set up the, yeah, um, a way for people to go and look for OER content, right? And in a way of promoting Open Aquella, so people you know, will want to use Open Aquella as a meta search engine. But it also is, you know, you look at it from the other side of, you know, we want our learners to be able to access content and we want to be able to share out and be collaborative, right? Um, and so that would be kind of an interesting conversation uh, when you're, when you folks are ready. Yes, definitely. Um, I know there's, they are, um, people in better positions than myself looking um, into Open Equella. I think one of the other issues that we also have on our side is um, that uh, we, we struggle to get faculty to buy in. It's difficult to get them to really um, understand the value of open education resources. Um, they want to, you know, if they created something, they want to kind of give it to themselves. It's hard to get them to share. Well, that's, uh, that's that something is. that we've dealt with here. But if you can find it, it's, you really have to find some individual faculty members who start doing it. And then the, the administration has to put forth an IP policy that it's very clear to faculty that anything that they create, while I'm, you know, any learning objects that they create for courses while they're working at the university is 
the property of the university. And so that has to be, it's, you, you can't really get them to do it until the university makes it clear to them that, that the IP policy of the university is, is, requires that. And that's what they've done here. Um, and part of that is that because of our, one of our main imperatives is to reduce the cost of education, faculty get leave time, leave hours to work on courses, to create content for those courses. So like most of our general education courses do not require a textbook. And so when you start creating content, where are you gonna put it? Well, you don't want it to be embedded directly into the course. You wanna have a content management system. Some of the faculty, uh, a lot of them will just create PDFs for each chapter. Um, others are a little more sophisticated and they'll, they will create a textbook per se um, in some other format or some just, some use HTML. Some are more experienced, but the idea is, is that you can go into our Equella instance and you can look up a course and you can see what's available for that course. So uh, not everyone has done it, but over time, uh, as if the administration buys into this, then they just kind of require it. And that's what, what's happened here. They'll say, uh, for this course, we're not going to have 10 different versions of, you know, Humanities 101. We're going to have one version. And here's the content. You can supplement that with things. But it's really, they felt like it was unfair to the students that, that you know, in one course they get this, one course they get that. So it's, uh, it takes time. But if the administration buys into it and requires it, then it happens. There are some courses where that's not the case, but in our GE, it's it's pretty you know it's it's much more uniform than it was say ten years ago. All right, I really appreciated this discussion. Folks, uh, Jen, are we just about at time? Yes, we are. All right. Uh, so, what I'd encourage you, I will, I'll check with the moderator, uh, with Jen, and and see if there's a way that we can make this more uh, public. Um, but you know, just because there's a lot of names in here and stuff, um, just to get some of this information out. What I'd encourage you to do is, if this is, if this you found this useful. Uh, to please give some thought on how we can make it better next year um, in ter terms of talking about, uh, you know, just some of the difficulties and just what I saw through here. Um, you know, Tiffany was is sending something to or sending those steps from to Sakai uh, to Sangyun, right? And just that that connection point is what I was looking for. Um, you know, it's not necessarily, you know, pushing an application or an idea. It's just like, hey, I have a problem and you know what? I know how to solve that. And we're able to make those connections. So I appreciate your folks' discussion and participation. Thank you everyone for joining us. And we look forward to seeing you all tomorrow for more breakout sessions. Uh, and if anybody has any ideas, as we've mentioned, there are still slots available in the lightning talk. So you can uh, pop in and as you may have seen earlier, Kind of anything goes. You don't have to have a strict presentation to make it happen. So we'll look forward to seeing you tomorrow. Take care. Thank you. Hey, Jen. Yeah, can you stop the recording? Sure.